Hello, friends. Welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour. I'm John Lomacang, and thank you for taking the time to join us. I would say this would be probably one of the most thought-provoking, time-geared messages that I've preached in a long time, bringing us right to the pages of the book of Revelation. And one of my favorite terms, calibrating our minds to understand where we are in the unfolding scenes of last day events. So before we go any further, I invite you to bow your heads with me as I ask for the Lord's leading today. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. Guide our minds that your purpose may be accomplished, that the message may be clear, and the people will be awakened to the times in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture that we're going to begin with is Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. And the message is entitled, very sobering title, but you'll understand why. The seduction of Christianity. The seduction of Christianity. Wow, what a title. But let's dive into the Bible. Revelation 16, verse 13. John said, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. As this message is going forth, there is a battle in the making. That great day of God Almighty is hastening quickly. And Satan's concern is he wants to find a way to marshal the forces of earth under these three unclean spirits and directives to gather them together to fight against God and to fight against his remnant church. Make no mistake about it. Satan is not concerned about the world in general, but he is concerned as Revelation 12 and verse 17 makes it very clear and we'll look at that in just a moment. But he is marshalling his forces together for one final push against the people of God on earth. Now, the reason why the Bible uses the word frogs in Revelation chapter 16 and verses 13 is when you study the plagues on Egypt, the very last plague that God allowed the magicians of, of Egypt to duplicate was the frogs plague. The frogs plague. Now, what makes this so significant is frogs use their tongues. Frogs use their mouths. Frogs use instruments that guide their minds by what comes out of their mouths. And so the Bible is making it very clear that it appeared as though the Egyptian magicians had the same power that Moses had. But God allowed them to make it appear as though the power was the same. Here's the point that's very important in laying the foundation. When men persist in rebellion against the truth, they will appear to have the same power working through them that is working through God's true servants. But what's the difference? The end result of their deceptive power is to lead men to ultimately reject God and his word. And make no mistake about it. Jesus warned of this coming deception in Matthew 24 and verse 24, the rejection of God's word. But there is a deeper meaning behind it. Listen to the words of Matthew 24 and verse 24. Jesus said, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Let's look at that even the elect. Now, there's a deeper meaning behind the use of miracles than the miracles themselves, because Satan knows that the elect is standing in his way. God's remnant church, God's commandment-keeping church, described in Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 14, 12, Revelation 22, 14, he knows that there is one power standing between him and total domination of Christianity. And he's seeking through false Christs and false prophets to find a way, three unclean spirits, Revelation 16, to deceive, if possible, even the elect. 
because he knows that the elect have been armored by God with the truth of God's word. That's why the psalmist David said in Psalms 91, your truth shall be my shield and defense. So he knows that if he can get them to turn away from the truth, to begin to ignore the truth, he can marshal them together to be a part of the forces that ultimately fight against God and his last day message. That's why John is warning us in Revelation. He's giving a warning to the remnant to be careful who they listen to because that's what happened out of the mouth of the dragon, mouth of the beast, mouth of the false prophet. Who are these three powers? The mouth of the dragon. That represents spiritualism. In Christianity, the first stage of deception in Christianity took place when Christians rejected the biblical teaching that the soul is not immortal. The first contribution to this deception was from spiritualism, the immortal soul. But the second deception was from the mouth of the beast. What did the beast do? The beast represents the power of pagan Rome turned into papal Rome, not the people, the movement of Catholicism. And what did they do? They change the solemnity of God's Sabbath to the first day of the week. Notice this, spiritualism, the immortality of the soul. Rome, the, the sanctity of Sunday, which is not supported. Neither of those two points are supported by scripture. But there's not only the dragon, there's the beast. Then there's the false prophet, false Christ and false prophets. Now, why false prophets? Because according to God's word, the prophet is the mouthpiece of God. What happens when a prophet becomes a false prophet? They appear to be a true prophet, but what they say is antithetical to God's word. We are living in the age where Christianity has an external appearance of truth. But when you listen to what is being said, it is not being found in God's word. My brethren, we are approaching the most polarizing test for the church in modern history. These times demand unquestionable loyalty to heaven's agenda. The surface may look calm, but the undercurrent will claim its victims. The neutral places are strategically being eliminated. And that's why these times demand watchmen, watchmen on the wall to blow the trumpet. I'm calling myself a watchman. Men that uphold the truth of God's word, men that are not seduced by the popular brand of religion and all of its accoutrements are watchmen on the wall. And why is it not optional? Listen to the words of Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 6. He says, but if the watchman, but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hands. Now let's look at the two sides. The opposing forces are clearly defined in scripture. On one side is God's side. Let's say the right side is God's side. Three angels proclaiming three messages to gather the people of God to salvation. But on the left side, on Satan's side, three unclean spirits designed to gather the wicked to the point of destruction. Salvation on the right, under God's leadership, destruction on the left under Satan's leadership. And according to God's word, the remnant will face a triad of opposition, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. That triad of opposition is also a triad of deception because in these last days, Satan's got thousands of years of experience. He does not come directly towards us and say, here I am, you're next. He doesn't come directly towards us and say, I'm going to deceive you. But God's agenda is clear and Satan's agenda is clear. These three dark forces are working behind the scenes to gather the world to its side. They are working deceptively to accomplish, hear me carefully, a predetermined agenda. Now, what is God's predetermined agenda? Luke 19, 10, here is God's predetermined agenda through Christ Jesus. He says in Luke 19, 10, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. There is only one purpose that heaven has is to save the lost. Praise the Lord for that. Heaven sent Jesus, 
The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. But Satan also has a predetermined agenda. And both of these agendas are going to clash in the final battle of Armageddon. Here is Satan's predetermined agenda. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. The Lord says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, if you know anything about how a lion works, the male lion is the one that makes the sound, that blood-curdling roar that comes from the depth of his chest. And you run in the opposite direction with a female lion making no sound at all is there, as one of my favorite preachers says, to gather the groceries. You hear the noise here, but you run there, and the female lion is waiting for that person to devour. But here's the question. How do we shield ourselves from Satan's predetermined agenda? My brother and sisters, we must remember how the devil works. You see, he began a war in heaven. The war was Satan opposing Christ. But it was really darkness against light. But Satan hid his agenda from the angels that joined him. Now, why do I say that? I don't believe for a moment that if Satan said to the angels, I want you to be lost, I don't believe for a moment that they would have joined his side. But he traded light for darkness, truth for error, and he caused one third of the angels to fall with him by hiding his agenda. He deceived them into thinking he was pushing, pushing his truth when in fact he was really pushing deception. You see, the three unclean spirits are gathering religious and political leaders for the final push against the three angels' messages and against God's remnant people. But the question you might ask is, how can Satan create an alliance? How can he successfully create an alliance between God's people and rebellious fractions? How could that possibly happen? Well, let's consult the scripture to see, to see how it did happen. The Bible tells how it happened in the past. Notice what he says. 1 Kings chapter 11, and verse 2, and this is about Solomon. Notice what happened. The Lord said to Solomon, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. They will turn away your hearts after their gods. The Lord warned Solomon. He said, do not intermarry with the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Egyptians. Don't marry anyone from among those who are opposing God's movement. But Solomon did that. And the Bible said Solomon hung, clung to these in love. So it worked in Solomon's day. He ignored God's counsel and created an alliance between those that opposed the very message he stood for. But Solomon was not the only example. Look at Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 25. Look at how Satan did it in the past. Now, before I read that scripture, let me say this. He has thousands of years of experience. He always studied God's people in every age to see how he can get them off course to ultimately accomplish their demise. He did that in the past, and he's planning to do it again in the future. But notice how he accomplished it through Ahab. You know, Ahab married Jezebel, a woman that worshipped the gods of Baal, dark gods against the gods of Israel and Judah. 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25. Notice what the Bible says. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, what did she do? Stirred him up. Okay, don't forget that. Jezebel stirred up Ahab to ultimately rebel against the very message that God had delivered to Israel, a message he had entrusted to Israel, thinking the message was safe, an alliance between a woman of false worshiper and a man of God created an alliance. And what did she do? She found a way to stir him up. Hold on to that. You see, this is significant. This is vitally important for the foundation when an alliance is created between God's people 
and movements that oppose God, God's people always suffer. Why? Solomon and Ahab, their hearts turn from God. And what ultimately happens? Those very people that were chosen by God to perform a godly task, when they are deceived, they perpetuate unimaginable wickedness. Hold on to that phrase. Unimaginable wickedness after they are stirred up. You see, it took Satan 4,000 years to accomplish it. But his deception to Israel was so complete. Hear me carefully. His deception of Israel was so complete that he led the Jewish leaders to orchestrate the death of Jesus Christ. You might say, wait a minute. Think about it. The very nation that was entrusted with the truth for generations, for nearly 4,000 years, Satan had so completely deceived their leaders that they ended up orchestrating the death of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because, my brethren, he's seeking to do the very same thing against the remnant church. Why did he go after the Jews? Because he knew that the Jews had a message for the world. The Lord made it very clear in Acts chapter 13, it was necessary the light be given to you and that you be a light to the ends of the earth. But they chose not to. They resisted the rise of the gospel. They resisted the proliferation of the gospel and the world didn't get it. And the Jews ultimately re rejected Jesus and Jesus ultimately rejected the Jewish leaders. He said, your house has left to you desolate. I can't use you any longer because the very nation I chose entered into an apostate condition and the Lord chose 12 disciples instead. I would suggest to you that Satan is seeking to do the very same thing today. And you're going to find out how. You see, when we roll the curtain back, here's what happens. Religious leaders and Christian leaders are not necessarily the same. I'm going to repeat that. A religious leader and a Christian leader are not necessarily the same. Don't forget that. Because Satan has found a way to cloak religion and make it appear as though it's Christian, but it has an undercurrent that's darker because it has a greater ability to deceive because it looks like a Christian movement. You go back to the days of Christ when Jesus was arrested, taken before Pilate. And now we're going to dive a little deeper into the message. There was a feast that was held on a yearly basis. And Pilate, the governor, gave the people an option to choose who to be released, Jesus or Barabbas. Let's dive into this story in Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 to 17, and see how it fits. And the phrases I want you to remember are predetermined agenda and stirred up hearts. Notice Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 to 17. Here's what the Bible says. Now at the feast, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. That's who the multitude wished. And at that time, verse 16, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Verse 17, therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Now, let's break this down. Pilate is a political leader. Pilate put the choice in the hands of the people to decide, but the people were manipulated to choose Barabbas over Jesus. Notice Matthew chapter 27 and verse 20, while Pilate is thinking that the people have the choice, notice what's happening behind the scenes. Matthew 27 and verse 20. The Bible says, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Okay, now let's grab that. That sounds odd. How can a people to whom the message was given for 4,000 years, how can they perpetrate such a dark evil and say they want Barabbas and they want to destroy Jesus. What could happen to a nation 
that they could turn their hearts so extremely against God that they orchestrate the death of his son. But notice, you see, the people were given the choice, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude, meaning the chief priest had a predetermined agenda. Long before Pilate said to the people, which one should I release? The chief priests and elders went to the people, and the Bible says the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Now watch this. Let's go to Mark chapter 15 and verse 11. Let's see this worked out again. And there's another phrase you're going to see. The very same thing that Jezebel did to Ahab was what the chief priest did to the crowds. Matthew 5, Mark 15, verse 11. Here's what the Bible says. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. The chief priests, look at the two things they did. They persuaded the multitude and they stirred up the multitude. They persuaded the multitude and they stirred up the multitude. I made a statement a moment ago that the chief priests had a predetermined agenda. What do I mean by that? When Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, the chief priests decided that from that day on, Jesus must die. You might remember the story. If not, read the story of the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. When Jesus raised the Lazarus, Jesus has so de destroyed their false doctrinal beliefs of the immortal soul that they determined that Jesus must die. And they sought ways to perpetrate the death of Christ. And you know the rest of it. Judas betrayed Jesus, sold him for 30 pieces of silver, and the chief priests and elders stirred up the multitudes, persuaded the multitudes. Well, today, my brothers and sisters, the chief priests had a predetermined agenda. And today, hear me carefully, religious leaders have a predetermined agenda. And that predetermined agenda is designed to accomplish what it did in the days of Christ. Jesus, represent, Jesus is the way and the truth. They wanted to get rid of Jesus because his truth didn't match their concepts. I can't even say their truth because truth is not opposing. Truth is truth. Jesus' truth was in opposition to what the chief priests and elders believed. So they said, in order for our false beliefs to continue, we've got to get rid of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. They had a predetermined agenda. And today, my brothers and sisters, the religious leaders of our day have a predetermined agenda. Now, let me remind you, going back to the first scripture, I'll just say it to you. Listen, the three unclean spirits out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan, spiritualism, out of the mouth of the beast, Rome, Catholicism, but out of the mouth of the false prophets, Protestantism that repudiates the principles of Protestantism, which is in fact sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible only. Now I said it before, but it fits right here. Protestantism today doesn't believe what the Bible teaches, that the soul is not immortal. Protestantism today teaches that you die and go directly to heaven. Protestantism today has rejected the scriptures on the fact of the Sabbath. They believe to a large degree that Sunday is the new day of worship. It cannot be supported by scripture. Where do they get that from? The dragon, the immortal soul. What he, the lie he told Eve in the Garden of Eden, you will not surely die. Where do they get the first day of the week from? Rome during the Dark Ages. Transferring the solemnity from the Sabbath to the first day. So on two levels, the dragon and the beast has done its job. But what's left? The false prophets. People to whom the word of God has been delivered. During the Dark Ages, a Protestant movement began, a back to the Bible movement. And for the last 2,000 years, Satan has been working to get the Protestant movement to be the very movement that rejects the truth of God's word. And today, my brethren, it is happening. Let's go on. Look at this quotation from Councils to Writers, page 58, paragraph 2. I'm going to move a little bit more quickly now because it's very deep. Satan's attacks against the advocates of the truth will wax more bitter and determined to the very close of time. As in Christ's day, 
the chief priests and rulers stirred up the people against him. But look at the transition. So today, the religious leaders will excite bitterness and prejudice against the truth for this time. What will be the result? The people will be led to acts of violence and opposition, which they would never have thought of had they not been imbued with the animosity of professed Christians against the truth. You might wonder how Christians can get to the place where they can name the name of Christ and fight and war and even go for the killing of other people on the other hand because it's professed Christianity. What we're seeing happening in our world today, what we see taking place in the very avenues of Christianity today is not anything linked to the lovely Christ, to the humble Savior, to the one who says, thou shall not kill, to the one who says, love thy neighbor as thyself, to the one who says, if you hate your brother, you murder him already. What we see happening in Christianity today is not from God's word, it's Christianity gone awry. But the sad reality is, is Christianity gone awry just an attempt to overthrow Christianity? Or is it just like it was in the days of Christ, an attempt to overthrow Jesus himself, who is the way and the truth? You see, the quotation we just read made it very, very clear. The animosity that we see today has an underlying motive behind it, has an underlying agenda behind it. It's not just hatred for the sake of hatred, but there's a deeper issue coming. And but slowly but surely, the three unclean spirits are going to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, of the kings of the earth and of the whole world, religious leaders, political leaders, financial leaders, politicians, pastors, pulling them together. And what is the focus? To fight against the truth. So you have to ask yourself the question, how else can such a divide exist? How can Christians that sing to the glory of God on one day become stirred to take the life of those that do not share their convictions on another day? The same danger that Jesus warned his disciples about in his day is the same danger that the people of God face today. Look at John chapter 16, verse 1 to 3. Here's what Jesus warned his disciples of. He said, these things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, listen to this. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. He would think that he offers God service. In other words, there is no more dark crime than whenever crimes are committed in the name of Christ. We're Christians and we can take your life at our leisure because we don't believe what you believe. It's happening in our world today. Why am I so passionate? I'm concerned about that, but I'm even more concerned about the direction of God's remnant church because Satan's aim is against God's remnant church. Today, the drastic change that's taking possession of Christianity is not incidental, but it is intentional. The manipulation fracturing the church today is due to a, hear me carefully, a seductive influence of multitudes by religious and political leaders. Why? Why is there a seduction? Because the truth is a defense. Why is the truth a defense? Look at John 8 and verse 32. The Bible says in the words of Christ, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Is the devil concerned about freedom? Absolutely not. Now here's the context. The devil is not concerned about freedom in the sense of the same freedom Christ offers, freedom from, from sin, freedom from violence, freedom from hatred. Satan wants to use the supposed freedoms to perpetrate hatred, to perpetrate violence. And now as I go even deeper, one thing we must remember, the phrase predetermined agenda. Not only did Jesus come to seek and save those who are lost, but there is a Revelation chapter 13 scenario that we must not forget. And I'll share that with you right now. Revelation 13 cannot be changed. The scenario cannot be altered. This is vitally important because as I mentioned earlier, and it fits right now, let me read it to you. Revelation 13 verse 11. 
Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. All right. Are you ready for it? I hope you're ready for it. Here it is. This represents unmistakably the rise of the United States in Bible prophecy. Let's look at the three powers I mentioned earlier. The dragon. From the Garden of Eden, Satan began a war by perpetrating the idea that men had an immortal soul. During the Dark Ages, through the second power of Revelation 16, the beast, that lie was ingrained in the minds of people in the Dark Ages. They believed the soul was immortal. That's where, that's where purgatory came from and limbo in the idea that you die and go straight to heaven. It all came from there. But then Rome went to the next step, introducing a false day of worship that is not supported by Scripture. And Rome sought to wipe out the Christian church during the Dark Ages, but was unsuccessful because when Rome sought to wipe out the Christian church where the church existed in Europe, the Bible says in Revelation 13, the earth, op the earth opened its mouth and helped the woman. By the way, that's Revelation 12. The earth opened its mouth and helped the woman. Why did the earth open its mouth? When the Protestant Reformation began, Rome tried to flood the truth with the counter-reformation, art, music, literature, science, all these varying degrees of new introductions to get people's minds away from the rise of the Bible because the Protestant reformers began to go back to Scripture and Rome said, how can we get their minds away? And while they tried to flood the church to get rid of the truth, the Bible says the earth opened its mouth and helped the woman. But we just read in Revelation 13, verse 11, we saw a beast coming up out of the earth. That beast represents the United States with two horns. What are those two horns? A Protestant form of religion and a republic form of government. Those two stand as safety for the church as long as we still are a people that stand on sola scriptura and people that still believe in the freedom of religion in America, the nation is safe. But let me make a very important point. Those days are quickly going into the past because the Bible, to a large degree, its truths have been rejected and glossed over for favor of something that is not supported by Scripture. And how did that happen? Let's see, uh, let's see how this lamb-like beast is going to change its exterior. Now let's see how it happened in the past. The dragon, direct confrontation with Eve in the garden, that's the woman representing the church of today. The dragon in Revelation 12 faces the woman again. But this time, she's the one that's keeping the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 12, 17. She's not buying what he's selling any longer. But follow this. The dragon in the garden. The beast during the dark ages, Rome. But then a lamb-like beast comes up in the United States. A lamb-like beast. Who is the lamb in scripture? None other than the person of Christ. A lamb-like beast. Christian values the word of God rising up to give safety to the woman. So how can we cause the woman to be carried away? Let me allow you to understand something that's significant here. How can you manipulate people without them knowing that they are being manipulated? In comes something called the Hegelian dialectic. A man by the name of George William Hegel created one of the most manipulative theories called the Hegelian dialectic. For the dialectic to be successful, it relies on contradictory processes and two opposing signs. Listen to this. Hegelian dialectic is a framework for guiding thoughts and actions into conflicts that lead to synthetic solutions, which can only be introduced once those being manipulated take a side that will advance the predetermined agenda. Okay, follow me carefully. Hegelian dialectic, the framework for guiding thoughts. Look at these four graphics. Let's start with the Hegelian dialectic. Here's the first graphic. Very significant. The Hegelian dialectic starts when you have a thesis and an antithesis. Two sides. There must be opposition. Look at the second one. In order for these sides to work, there has to be a conflict. One believing one thing, the other believing something opposite. And they enter into a conflict. 
but what happens as a result of the conflict. Look at the third slide. Here it is. In the midst of the conflict, thesis and antithesis results in synthesis. Now, somebody might think, well, those two sides created the synthesis, but the Hegelian dialectic has a fourth part. Look at this next slide. There was a predetermined agenda that allowed the synthesis to occur. Look at the very next graphic to understand exactly what I mean by this. It says, the Hegelian dialectic works when a thesis giving rise to its reaction, an antithesis which contradicts or negates the thesis, and the tension between the two being resolved by means of a synthesis. So let me make it very clear. Pastor John, what are you saying? How can the devil sneak up on us and so successfully manipulate the church of today to ignore the very important factors by getting them to focus on something that creates division rather than unity? Here's the point. Synthesis is contained in the predetermined agenda. You saw that slide? Thesis versus antithesis creates a synthesis. I'll give you a slight example. And I'll use this example. If I don't like chocolate, I'll say, ma'am, I'll do everything I can to get chocolate off the market. But then I go to the chocolate manufacturers and say, sir, I'll do everything I can to make sure that you can sell your chocolate. If you vote for me, I'll make sure you can sell your chocolate. Ma'am, if you vote for me, I'll make sure that chocolate, chocolate is off the market. And they both vote for the same individual. And while he gets that vote, he's in office to accomplish a predetermined agenda. And they don't even know it. So the synthesis is contained in the predetermined agenda. In other words, it doesn't have to be true on either side as long as the predetermined agenda is accomplished exactly how it was in the days of Christ. The chief priests and the elders did not care about Pilate or the multitude. They cared about Christ and they used the multitude to manipulate Pilate to get rid of Jesus. And it made it look like their hands were completely clean because the chief priests and elders didn't yell for the crucifixion of Christ. The multitude says, give us Barabbas. Friends, today, the church is being torn apart by issues that are not really the issues. The remnant church is being distracted into looking in a completely different direction when in fact, God has called us to look into the direction of proclaiming the three angels' messages. But who's opposing the three angels' messages, the three unclean spirits? But they can't come to us and say, you know, get rid of that and preach something else. No, they've got to create conflict within us. Have you wondered why there's been so much conflict in the Adventist church? Because we're forgetting that our call is not the issues of the day. Our call is to proclaim the three angels' messages, to uplift Christ, not to fight amongst one another, not to think that this earth is our kingdom. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my disciples will fight. And Satan's plan is to get us to fight so that we cannot be focused on God's predetermined agenda. And the devil will get us to focus on issues that have nothing to do with the agenda of heaven. That's why I look at the issues that we are fighting over today. Look at the issues dividing us. On one side, you have mask versus anti-mask and vaccine versus anti-vaccine and pro-life versus pro-choice and same-sex marriage versus both sex marriage and LGBT versus straight and blue lives matter versus black lives matter. These issues, my brothers and sisters, that we are fighting over as a remnant church are not the issues of eternal life. But somehow, our adversary, the devil, walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, has found a way to divide those who should be united on proclaiming the last message of warning to the world. I mean, what else would you do if you were the devil? If you heard the phrase, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. As the adversary, you say, I can't make that happen. I can't let that go on unopposed. I've got to find some way to divide that church. If I let them preach that message, I've lost. And my brothers and sisters today, let me encourage you with passion in my heart. It's time to get back to proclaiming the three angels' messages. All these issues that are coming up in our midst are intended to divide us. When in fact, Jesus said the only way the world will know that he has sent us is by unity. 
one church, one Lord, one foundation, one God, one Father of all, a unity that Satan hopes to become a division and a diversity. These issues, my brothers and sisters, are designed to manufacture controversy and division. But why is this so significant? Because before the final issue that will ultim ultimately divide America, and why America? Because the very last phrase, the very last phase of Satan's deception is to get this earth beast, this lamb-like nation, to turn and begin to speak like a dragon. And if you listen to what's happening today in our world, it's already beginning to speak like a dragon. But what is the call on God's people? To get back to the real lamb, not to allow the lamb-like to distract, but to uplift the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What's happening in our church today? The issues are dividing us. The world is calling on us to be political. But Jesus is calling on us to be Christ-like. But why is this so significant? You see, before the final issue that divides America is introduced, it is imperative to manipulate us to gauge our pliability in preparation for the final issue. In other words, your moldability on political issues will signal your plasticity on religious issues. In other words, if I can get you, if I can use politics to distract you and join me in a predetermined agenda that will ultimately undermine the very truth that you embrace, then I will know that I could rely on you and you join me in your own destruction. It happened in Solomon's day. It happened in Ahab's day. It happened in Christ's day. So deeply did it accomplish in Christ's day, so deeply did Satan succeed in Christ's day that the very nation that he chose for 4,000 years ended up crucifying him. My brothers and sisters, the issues are not what you hear. There's a deeper issue. Listen to this quotation. Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 451. Listen to this. While men are sleeping... Satan is actively arranging matters so that the Lord's people may not have mercy or justice. Wow. What is the issue? Here it is. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue. All the issues dividing us are not the issue. The real issue is the sanctity of God's law. The real issue is the sign between the creator and his redeemed. The leaders are concealing the true issues. But here's the challenge that the Hegelian dialectic is manipulating us into falling into this trap. And many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. Undercurrent stepping into a shallow ocean only to be drawn in by its undercurrent. Many people think that these issues are innocuous. They're not that dangerous. I mean, after all, we could agree on certain things. It doesn't really matter what we believe politically, as long as we agree on something. And what we don't realize is every step we take away from the mission that God has called us to is a step towards compromise. Every step we take in the direction where the enemy has complete control by his predetermined agenda to stamp out truth we begin to become aids in accomplishing our own demise. The leaders are concealing the true issues. Many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. And listen to how the quotation ends. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian. Yes, are you listening to the voice of Christians in America today? Why is it so loud? Because America is the final frontier. America is the only frontier that Satan has not completely embraced and destroyed. Now, we can say he destroyed it morally. Yes, that's a fact. But the church of God, the remnant church, still exists in America. The three angels' messages is being proclaimed in America. The truth of God's word is being upheld in America. i got to find a way to get those folk that believe the three angels' messages to stop proclaiming it. i got to get them to fight each other rather than fight against me. So these divisive issues that are being pushed on us, brethren, Revelation 13 scenario cannot be changed. Now, why is that so significant? Revelation 13 has two pictures. 
Rome, Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10, and the United States in Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 down to 14, down to 18. Two powers. And I repeat this, as I said earlier, the scenarios cannot be changed. The scenarios cannot be changed. Let me be specific. It doesn't matter who the papacy is led by. It doesn't matter who the pope is. Rome's agenda is the same. Are you ready for an eye opener? It doesn't matter who's in office. Revelation 13's scenario for America does not change. It doesn't matter. Left, right, blue, red, it doesn't matter. Revelation 13 scenario does not change. This nation will follow in the footsteps of Rome and repudiate every principle of its constitution. It's not going to change. It doesn't matter who's in office. But here we are fighting amongst ourselves about who's in office when in fact the only office that we should be concerned about is where Jesus abides. It's not about the White House. It's about the right house. And Jesus will never be replaced by any earthly king, government, president, or potentate. I'll say amen to that myself. But we are being divided, my brothers and sisters. We are forgetting our mission. We are being distracted. We are being called to the left and the right. In Sabbath morning and the internet, we argue against each other, argue one point against the other, fighting for men that are simply frail individuals that will sooner or later take their last breath when in fact Jesus ever liveth to make intercession for us and Christians who are in conflict with one another cannot proclaim that message because the world says, look at the church. How could I believe a church so divided against itself? And you know what the Bible says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. We must never forget that that dragon from the Garden of Eden that worked through Rome during the Dark Ages has one final movement blocking his path, the remnant people of God. And he makes it very clear what his predetermined agenda is. Remember Isaiah 14, 14, he said, I will be like the Most High. But because he could not replace God, he came after Jesus. Jesus was victorious over death, ascended to heaven, is now sitting on the right hand of the Father in heaven. So he only has the woman to go against, the woman who God has ordained to proclaim this final message to the world. And what's happening to her, she is being distracted. My brothers and sisters, I'm calling you back to unity because the devil makes it clear what his agenda is. Revelation 12 and verse 17, look at what he says. Look at what he says. Unapologetically, look at what he says. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman, Satan angry with the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who are they which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ? He says it. Not even my words, although I like the fact that John, the revelator, wrote it, and my name is John, but Satan is making it very clear. He is not concerned with those who reject the authority of Scripture. He is not concerned about those that ignore the Ten Commandments of God, all ten, including the one that says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. He is not concerned with those that intentionally reject God's Sabbath, which is what Protestant America has done to a large degree because Protestant America today believes exactly what Rome believes when it comes to the day that they worship, when it comes to what Satan's lie was in the Garden of Eden. The immortal soul, the dragon did his part in the Garden of Eden. The sanctity of Sunday, Rome did its part during the Dark Ages. And is it ironic today, Rome... And the church of today claiming to follow the Bible has turned its back on the Bible and adopted dogmas that are not supported by Scripture. But let me be very direct, supported by Satan and the power that he has given authority to. Revelation 13, 4 says the dragon, speaking of Rome, the dragon gave the beast its power, its seat, and its great authority. So there's one final push. Satan is not concerned about those who teach that the soul is immortal. My brothers and sisters, the unity that is eroding the walls of the Seventh-day Adventist church and the Seventh-day Adventist mind is strategically and satanically 
orchestrated because Satan is not content with neutrality. He wants to break down the walls. You see side issues that draw us away from the Great Commission. Instead of exalting Jesus, we exalt mortal man. These are not the issues that Christ wants us to focus on. He wants us to get back to proclaiming Christ. And that's why I want to encourage the remnant church today that Satan wants the remnant church to be issue-oriented and no longer mission-oriented. You see this thing we said, the gospel is to all the world? He says, not if, I can, not if I can have anything to do about it. Not if I can have a say about that. And he's seeking to divide us. Sabbath morning, what is it like in your church? What is it like when you get together and have fellowship lunch? What do you talk about? Are you talking about mortal men? Are you standing behind the flags of earth or the banner, the blood-stained banner of Jesus? What do you talk about? Are you fighting about men that can die when the breath of God is just immediately snatched from their nostrils? Or are you uplifting the Christ who ever liveth to make intercession for you? What are you talking about? My brothers and sisters, Satan's final push, he makes it clear, is against those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. The reason why he appears to be so successful is many who claim to believe the remnant message are embracing man's word over the sure word of prophecy. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we are told in Scripture when it comes to prophecy, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star arises in your heart. That's right, my brothers. The day star is arising in our hearts. Who is the day star? Jesus Christ, the bright and morning star. When you study the pages of prophecy, you will not be deceived because the scenarios cannot be changed. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, the Lord says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Get this. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, I will do all my pleasure. My brothers and sisters, it's not the issues of frail politicians. It's the issue of the almighty God. It is the issue of the risen Savior that we are called to campaign for. It is the issue of the three angels' messages that we are called to proclaim. Stop proclaiming the issues of frail men fighting for things that are going to die when these men die. But Jesus ever liveth to make intercession. It's time for the remnant church to get back to the business of heaven, not the business of the left versus the right. And by the way, if you follow that train of thought, when Jesus died on the cross, there was a criminal on the left and there was a criminal on the right. No matter what side you're on, you're a criminal. Focus on the man in the middle. I say amen to that myself. Jesus is the one that... We are called to focus on Jesus is the one we are called to uplift because the Christian leaders of today are eroding the walls. Listen to this quotation by Rick Warren in the book, in the magazine, Christianity Today. Christianity Today, December 5, 2014. Rick Warren, a very vocal religious leader, says, when you talk about Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelicals, Fundamentalists, Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, well, they would all say we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the Bible. We believe in the resurrection. We believe salvation is through Jesus Christ. These are the big issues. That's what he says. So watch this. Doctrinal differences. But let's not focus on the doctrinal differences because the big issues are what we have in common. These are the big issues. Let's ignore the things that we don't have in common. But what's happening here? What is in fact happening here? When we don't receive the truth of God's word as it is in Jesus, something happens. Look at Revelation 17, verse 13. God is in charge, my brothers and sisters. God is still at the steering wheel of heaven's agenda. What, are this, what is the Bible saying about all these fractions? These have one mind, Revelation 17, 13, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Rome is seeking for this earth beast, the United States, to return to it the very persecuting power that it wielded during the Dark Ages. In America, since 1994, Protestants have united with Catholics into the third millennium. They're both pushing the same agenda, and we are caught in the middle because we're losing focus on Christ. Why is this significant? Look at Great Controversy, page 445, and paragraph 1. Listen to these very timely words. When the leading churches of the United States 
Look at the very next word, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall influence the state. Is it happening already? To enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions. Then Protestant America will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. My brothers and sisters, what's taking place here? Yeah, Rome is coming up, but Rome is not coming up on its own accord, but Protestants claiming to believe the Bible are pushing us back in the direction of Rome, creating a coalition between Rome and Catholicism, between Rome and, and Protestantism today, and they are boasting how the walls are no longer there, how we have abandoned the protest. How can there be, how can there be a protest? Kenneth Copeland, all these major leaders, there's no more protest. But when your position is no longer tolerated, Matthew 24, verse 9, What's going to happen to the remnant next? Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. My brothers and sisters, I end with a very urgent appeal to the remnant people of God, to those who honor the word of God, the undiluted, undiluted three angels' messages, those who stand where God calls us to stand. The question we must ask ourselves is, in Exodus 32 and verse 26, here is the question today. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Today, as the modern Moses, I'm saying to you, are you on the Lord's side? If you are, join me in the coalition of heaven because the coalition is polarizing. The groups are in conflict. The outcome of the seduction of Christianity is being worked out in our midst. Choose you this day whom you will serve so that when the world is seduced, and all the agendas of man have run its course, you will stand with Christ because you've chosen today to stand on his side. May God bless you in your decision.